Uh, basically, Organic Athlete, I kind of started myself, and it's been a, a lot of time and effort but um, on, on my part. But late, the past few months, it's people have come out of the woodwork, volunteers to really come help out. And you see they're wearing these shirts and the orange tags, and they're the people making this happen today. And, but my friend Lenny has come on board, and she's really excited to make this happen. She's a, a big part of uh, make an organic athlete go to the next level. So she's going to introduce uh, our next speaker, Doug Graham. And Doug, when you come up, if you could put this on. Um, well, there's all kinds of things that I can say about Dr. Douglas Graham. Um, I met him about five years ago when I, on my own quest for health, was looking for some answers about health and nutrition, and uh, preferably through the raw vegan movement, which I had been experimenting with for a couple of years, but had been failing on repeatedly um, due to a variety of reasons. And when I came across uh, Doug, the first thing I thought was, wow, he's fit. And the next thing I thought was, wow, he's like, I can eat fruit. <laughs> this is awesome. And uh, I started implementing his program, and to my surprise uh, and pleasure, it just continued to work. Um, and as uh, a friend now of, of that entire time, five years, I'm blessed to have gotten to understand the information that he has to present. And I've seen him present tons of times. And aside from being a huge inspiration, um, and motivation to people all over the U.S. that I have met. He's a really great friend to everybody that he encounters. And um, I think that there's probably nobody more qualified to speak on the topic of nutrition and physical performance than Dr. Douglas Graham, who has extensive experience. He's been around the year for 25 years now. Uh, he has also uh, trained Olympic level and professional athletes with this lifestyle, giving them uh, their peak performance. So it is with my esteemed pleasure. <laughs> Okay, we're good to go now. Now you're happy? <laughs> Thank you, Lenny. Uh, I've, I've spoken in many basements um, <laughs> in my time. I've done a lot of presentations in basements, but this is the first one that was above ground level, I think, in my life. Uh, it's kind of different. and see if it still works above ground. Uh, there's so much material to cover and, and so little time. And I really want to make this as useful a presentation as I can, and so I'll avoid as much fluff as possible and get down to uh, essentially nitty-gritty as quickly as possible. Um, today's presentation is, is the sex life of the Central American sloth, I believe. <laughs> if, if that's not what you're here for, it's... No, okay. Um, sports nutrition in a nutshell is very uh, very challenging, I think, because literally every situation is unique. It's almost hard to pre-play um, what you're going to need for a, any given date if it's a future date other than today, because weather conditions play such a huge part in sports nutrition considerations. I, I remember training for the 1988 Orange Bowl Marathon, and I was living in the Florida Keys, so to, tra to run in the Orange Bowl, which was just Miami, I figured, oh, it's perfect, it's perfect, and the weather's going to be the same, and, and I can train all winter, the event wasn't until February, and so I just trained through the winter, and I came up with a lovely strategy, I left my house, I headed, I headed east on a road that, that basically went east, because, well, that's the only road there was, there's one that goes east and the other, one, the other side of it goes west. And that's the only road there is, because <clears throat> it's just a string of islands. So I'd head east, and I would just run until I saw the sun come up over the horizon. 
And as soon as I saw the sun come up over the horizon, I'd scurry home like a scared rabbit. And, and as far as I could get until I saw the sun, I could always make it home again from any distance, it turned out, without having to bring anything with me. And I got used to going out for 15 and 18 and 20 and 22 miles because I could go out 11 miles and turn around and run 11 miles if I turned around when I saw the sun. If I waited for 10 or 15 minutes, it was a completely different day. And I did that through the whole winter, did my long runs with no problem. And of course, uh, Florida Keys tend to have very moderated weather patterns. And throughout the winter, it was basically in the 60s or 70s every morning when I'd go run. And on the day of the marathon, the day before the marathon was the 10K, and it was spectacular. Misty, 60s, couldn't have been better. I'm thinking, wow, it was made. This is going to be idyllic. Wake up the next morning, the sun is shining, the wind has stopped, the heat is up, the humidity is high. It's February and there's humidity. And when the gun went off, it was 88 degrees. Not perfect for a marathon. Well, this is... <laughs> um, I didn't have a lot of experience in marathons, and I just did what I've always done. And by the time I drank water, which was somewhere around mile 16, I was in serious trouble. Just serious trouble. I was, it was humbling to finish that marathon. It was absolutely humbling. And um, I'll, I'll admit that it took me over five hours to complete it. And I never actually did get down on hands and knees, but it sure felt like it a few times. Um, and so the prep, very often, is going to be based on the unique conditions of the day. Because heat, and altitude, and, and barometric pressure, and cloud cover, and wind, and relative humidity, and how tired you are, and how hydrated you are from the day, all of these things are going to affect your needs on any given day. But we can at least cover a few basics that we know don't change as much. And since most of the time we're training, I know a few people who only compete. Is there anybody here who only competes and never trains? That is a strategy in training that I have met a few people who say, look, yeah, I compete two or three times a week. And at whatever I do, usually it's race walking, but it's not just race walking. And I compete a couple times a week and I never train. And that is one training strategy. But for most of us, we train a lot more than we compete. And so um, there are basics worthy of considering. And, most of them have to do with either fuel or the nutrients required to properly process that fuel. Can we go, can we go that far in nutrition and still be in agreement? Um, it's interesting because in the 60s, I was really interested in sports nutrition because I was trying to lose five pounds. I was a gymnast and I competed in track and field and all I knew was that if I could be five pounds lighter, Iron Cross would be a whole lot easier, and the other things that I was trying to learn how to do would be a lot easier to do. Anything that required strength, if I could just drop the five extra pounds. So I was playing around with a lot of different things in, in what I thought was sports nutrition, but to be quite honest, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, and, and most of what I tried was, would be laughable today. But uh, one guy... One guy came up with a, an idea, a guy named Dr. Cooper came up with an idea where he started stressing the idea of cardio exercises and coined the phrase aerobics. And then shortly after that, another man came up with an idea, or I should say popularized an idea that has been debunked before he presented it and has been debunked thousands of times since he presented it as being physiologically unsound, in fact untenable, impossible. But the idea nonetheless caught hold because people wanted to buy into it and the idea was called carbo-loading. You've all heard of carbo-loading? Well, as an athlete in the 60s, when I sat down to the training table at school, uh, we were served all the meat we wanted and potatoes. And this idea of carbo-loading 